This podcast is brought to you by HEC Paris. This podcast is brought to you by HEC Paris. Thank you all of you for your presence this afternoon. As the Dean of HEC Paris, it's an honor for me to host you, Dr. Pachery, in this institution. We all know that you're the chair of the Nobel Peace Prize winning Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the famous IPCC. And you're the Director General of Terry and of Yale Climate and Energy Institute. We all know that your name has become synonymous with climate change and the environment. You're a prominent researcher and environmental subjects recognized internationally for your efforts to build up and to dissem disseminate greater knowledge about man-made climate change and to lay the foundations for the measures that are needed to counteract such a change. For the ones who don't know exactly what is the background of Dr. Pachery, I will try to summarize it in very few words. Dr. Pachery has a PhD in industrial engineering and he has also a PhD in economics. Dr. Pachery, you've been on several international and national committees, including membership of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India, including the Advisory Board on Energy, which, reported, which is reporting directly to the Prime Minister of India. And you're a senior advisor to the administrator of the United Nations Development Program. Dr. Pachery has been president in 1988 and chairman between 1999 and 1990 of the International Association for Energy Economics. And he has been president of the Asian Energy Institute since 1992. In 1999, Dr. Pachery was appointed as a chairman of the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway Heritage Foundation. He was chosen as a member of the Economic Advisory Council in July 2001. In the same year, Dr. Pachery was honored with the Padma Bhushan, one of the highest civilian awards of India for his contribution to the field of environment. And from the French government, you've been awarded the grade of Officier de la Légion d'Honneur in 2006. Rajendra Pachori was awarded the NDTV Global Indian of the Year for the year 2007. The year after, in 2008, he received the second highest civilian award in India the Padma Vibhushan, sorry for my accent, for services to the environment. When not speaking on climate change, when not chairing meetings, when not making decisions for Terry or traveling or assessing for, IP, for the IPCC, Dr. Pachery has managed to write over more than 100 articles for academic journals and more than 23 books, and for light relief campuses, poetry. His other recreational diversion is, of course, cricket, and for this, he will always make time. In 2007, the Norwegian Nobel Committee decided that the Nobel Peace Prize was to be shared in two equal parts between the IPCC and Al Gore for their efforts to build up and disseminate greater knowledge about man-made climate change and to lay the foundations for the measures that are needed to counteract such change. Through the scientific reports it has issued over the past two decades, the IPCC has created 
an ever broader informed consensus about the connection between human activities and global warming. Thousands of scientists and officials from over 100 countries have been collaborating to achieve greater certainty as to the scale of the warming. Whereas in the 1980s global warming seemed to be merely an interesting hypothesis, the following decade produced firmer evidence in its support. And we all know in the, that in the last few years, the connections have become even clearer and the consequences still more apparent. You embody values which are critical to face the world's development. Your international scope, your spirit of innovation, your leadership and entrepreneurship are very important values that I'm sure we share here at HEC Paris. Despite the recent financial crisis and fears of a, of a durable global recession, the international business community continues to drive the growth of sustainability practices across all industry sectors and business levels. Within the past decade, Corporate social responsibility has begun to play an increasingly important role in determining a company's success, demonstrating the push from consumers to recognize the positive influence that can result from these initiatives of individual businesses. In recent years, this institution, HEC Paris, has embraced sustainability alongside corporate social responsibility and business ethics as an integral element of its curricula. This interest is under understandable as society now holds companies responsible for the social and environmental impact of their activities. If you allow me, I would like to highlight the various ways in which HEC Paris is adopting and importing the principles of corporate social responsibility. HEC Paris has invested dedicated faculty resources to address issues related to sustainable development. For instance, we have launched a specialized master's program on sustainability since six years. We've laid the Deloitte Chair on Energy Management since 2006. We have established a new chair on social business in 2008. And we have created the mission and action project inside the MBA program dedicated to the exploration and encouragement of alternative entrepreneurship financed by the HEC Foundation. We have welcomed the annual social business conference. We are participating in the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Initiative in partnership with Tsinghua in Beijing. And we have developed tight link with Africa and we're looking after, of course, the environmental impact of the campus. A conference like your conference, like the conference you're going to give in a few minutes, is very, very important for a business school like HSE Paris. The next generation of business leaders will have to strive to understand and leverage this aspect of corporate development to reap with, of course, some success, the rewards, and overcome the new challenges it will bring. I'm sure this conference will bring to the participants a sense of hope and ambition motivated to enhance their business skills and practices with the various ideas and solutions proposed. Once again, my dear colleague, Dr. Pachery, I'm very, very grateful and I would say very proud to welcome you here this afternoon at HSC Paris. Thank you very much.
dean of this uh, great institution of excellence, um, Dr. Valerie Clothier, faculty, students, colleagues. It's a great privilege for me to be present in this remarkable institution, um, the reputation of which is very well known. And I think each one of you, I'm sure, is extremely proud to be part of this remarkable institution. So I feel very touched. I feel very honored at having been given this opportunity. And uh, Dean, thank you for your very generous remarks, which I don't deserve. But I'm delighted to learn about the values that you are supporting in this institution. Because indeed, if you look at um, the failure of the economic system in the last year, year and a half, it has been essentially the function of a lack of ethics, a lack of values, and um, therefore it is important for us to learn from what has gone wrong. Uh, and I'm very happy to see that this institution has taken in hand teaching of ethics, teaching of corporate social responsibility, uh, because indeed in that lies the welfare of society at large and therefore the welfare of business organizations as well. Now before I get into my PowerPoint presentation, I thought I would tell you uh, just a couple of facts that may be of relevance. The IPCC, which I chair, uh, is a unique organization. It's uh, an intergovernmental body, but it mobilizes the best scientific talent from all over the world. Uh, however, it is not purely a scientific undertaking because since it's an intergovernmental body, Everything that we produce has to be at the dictates of governments, all the governments of the world. And each of the reports that we bring out has a part called a summary for policymakers. And that summary has to be approved word by word by all the governments of the world. So you can imagine that's not an easy task because when you're sitting with a group of 400 or 500 government delegates drawn from different uh, regions, different countries. Uh, they also bring very different perspectives and uh, very different interests. So when they approve of every single word in that summary for policymakers, uh, there are huge complexities. Um, and you have very strong arguments, very strong differences. But as a practice, the IPCC has been able to take decisions and reach closure and conclusion on everything that we do by consensus. So you can imagine it's, um, it's a unique undertaking where every word is agreed to by all the governments of the world. Now, that can be a very painful process, and I can tell you when the last synthesis report of the fourth assessment report was approved in, um, in Valencia, Spain, I had to go through 40 hours without any sleep because um, this was on a Thursday. We were going through this summary for policymakers word by word, and we were making very slow progress because every time somebody would raise a flag and say, no, I disagree with this, and then you have to get the authors to defend why they wrote that. So by the end of Thursday evening, I said that, look, the only way we can get this done is if we continue working through the night. And at 2 o'clock, all the translators leave, and you know they are a union, and you can't ask them to spend a single day single minute longer than the time that's been allocated. So then I have to appeal to everybody because the IPCC conducts all its sessions uh, with simultaneous translation in the six UN languages. 
So when the translators left, I had to appeal to all of them that we'll have to continue with English, and they agreed. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we managed to get this whole report approved by 7.30 in the morning. Then I had to come back and start the session again around 9.30. So I went to my hotel and lay down for a short while, took a shower, and came right back. And now we were approving the longer report on which this summary for policymakers is based. And the longer report is supposed to be accepted paragraph by paragraph. Now, that's a very difficult distinction to really accept because if you're dealing with a paragraph, you could very well object to a single word in that paragraph. Uh, however, the spirit of approval paragraph by paragraph is very different from the spirit of approving things word by word. But I found before the end of the day, again, we were making very slow progress. And at that stage, I had to tell these 450 odd delegates. I said, look, I've gone without sleep for 40 hours. I can assure you I can go without sleep for another 40 hours. But uh, <clears throat> on Saturday morning, the Secretary General of the UN is coming <coughs> to release this report <coughs> officially. What are we going to tell him? That, that we were not able to arrive at agreement on the report. Um, so and I said this with an obvious show of temper. And then I said, let's take a 15 minute break which we did, and at that stage, there were a bunch of wolves who were sitting over there when they went out, and 15 minutes when they came back, they were a bunch of lamb. <clears throat> so they had been transformed, <clears throat> and by 10.30 that night, we got agreement on, on the report as a whole. And I'm just giving you this anecdote to tell you that the IPCC is perhaps the only body that's able to provide the best of science and yet get the buy-in, get the sense of ownership from all the governments of the world. And that's why I think it has been able to make an impact on decision-making. And I think there are several parts of human endeavor where perhaps we could benefit from <coughs> such a collaboration. <clears throat> the, the other point I'd like to make before I start my PowerPoint presentation is, as the Dean very rightly mentioned, business is now becoming more and more accountable to the public. And therefore, what happens in public life, what happens in society at large, is of vital importance to business itself. As a friend of mine, rightly says, business cannot succeed in a society that fails. And therefore, I think all of us have a stake in seeing that society succeeds. If society fails, then any business that's operating in that society can possibly not succeed. So therefore, why are we talking about climate change? Essentially because climate change is going to impact on everything that business is involved in. And therefore, it's critically important to understand the elements of climate change where decision-making and human actions are required to correct the problem. I also want to emphasize that the problem of climate change is only a small part of a much larger problem, which is essentially the failure of sustainable development. If the world was developing on a sustainable basis, then we wouldn't have this problem of climate change. Because what has really happened is that in the pursuit of more and more production, more and more consumption, without regard to what's happening to the environment, we have filled this earth with a large quantity of gases that are clearly 
a deviation from the stable composition of the atmosphere that we have had for thousands of years. Okay, so I'll now start my uh, presentation, but um, <clears throat> let me begin by telling you about the scale and size of the IPCC involvement of authors from all over the world, and these are basically the 450 lead authors are the people who actually write the report. Over and above that, we in the last fourth assessment report had 800 contributing authors. And these are people who are specialists in some field or the other, and they provide contributions, written contributions, <clears throat> to these authors on the basis of which the knowledge that is given to them is made use of. And then at every stage of our drafting, we have expert reviewers who peer review every single draft. And they come up with a set of comments, and these are thousands of comments, which incidentally are posted on the website. <clears throat> and the authors have to either accept or reject uh, the comments that they receive. But they have to record what they did with it. If they accept it, they say the comment is accepted. If it is not accepted, then you have to give reasons why it is not accepted. So basically, the IPCC is a very transparent, very objective body. And the so-called uh, non-believers or deniers of climate change who call the IPCC some kind of grand conspiracy uh, must concede that if the IPCC is able to fool the whole world, then clearly they deserve uh, to, to succeed in this conspiracy. Um, now, one important conclusion that we came up with is that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. In other words, that there should be no scientific doubt on the fact that the climate system is warming. We also have recorded evidence now, as you can see from these graphs. If you look at global average temperature, going back to the beginning of industrialization, that's the middle of the 19th century, you can see there are fluctuations in temperature. And that's because nature itself brings about variations in the weather, variations in the climate, and therefore, during most of the 19th and the early part of the 20th century, these fluctuations were predominant. But if you look at the last 50 years, the trend is very clear. It's a trend where you see an increase in temperature. We also know that the bulk of this increase has come from human actions. Because quite apart from natural changes, we have now added this dimension of the human impacts of climate change because we are emitting so many of these different gases in such large quantities that essentially, if I can put it in very simple terms, it forms a kind of a blanket <coughs> over the Earth's atmosphere. And just as a blanket keeps you warm because it traps heat, similarly in this case also, all the sun's radiation that we receive, which a good part of which normally would have been re-radiated into outer space, is now getting trapped and stays within the terrestrial system. <coughs> Excuse me. As a result of which, if you look at the trend in the last five or six decades, it is clearly upwards. Now, as a result of warming of the oceans, and the melting of the bodies of ice, we have sea level rise. And during the last century, the sea level increased by about 17 centimeters. That may not seem like a lot, but remember, if you are living in a small island state, and the height of that small island state is barely a meter above sea level, then even 17 centimeters is a very serious threat to the existence of everything on that island. Uh, the last picture over here shows you the decline in 
northern hemisphere snow cover, and that's because of melting. And you can see in the last few decades that melting has certainly increased. The result is that the average Arctic temperatures have increased almost twice the global average in the past 100 years. Because as the body of ice in the Arctic region melts and exposes the ground for long periods during the year, that dark surface absorbs much more heat than would be the case if you had a white surface. So the result is, if you go to the Arctic region, which I've done myself, you will see a very rapid melting of ice. And this, of course, has very serious implications for all forms of life. It's for that reason that polar bears are now completely um, absent from places where they've been living for thousands of years. Because they are not able to get food. Polar bears normally uh, feed on seals. That is their favorite form of food. And normally what they do is you've got blocks of ice on the ocean. Every time a seal comes up, uh, a polar bear is just waiting to grab it. But now that the ice is not there, where is the polar bear going to find those seals? And essentially in the Arctic region, we've had uh, an extensive area of ice that is covering uh, the bodies of water, the ocean basically. And now that ice is melting, and therefore, that's having an impact on all uh, life systems in that region. Um, there's also an increase in extreme precipitation events. What are extreme precipitation events? Large quantities of rainfall, large quantities of snow in a very short period of time. And an example of this is what happened in the city of Mumbai in my own country in 2005, when one million people lost their homes. What happened was there was a, a huge downpour in a very short period of time, as a, as a result of which all the roads, the entire city was completely underwater. And several people were completely stranded overnight because they couldn't move. And some lost their lives because in today's automobiles, you can't roll down your window. It's electrically operated. And if there's an ele electrical short circuit, then you get stuck with the window in its own place. And, you, and if you were not strong enough, you weren't able to open the doors of the car. So a lot of people actually suffocated in their cars. I'm only mentioning this because these disasters are becoming more and more common, more and more extensive. And as climate change continues, they're going to get certainly more severe. And we have to be prepared for that. <clears throat> Tropical cyclones have started reaching higher intensities over the past few decades. And an example of this is uh, Cyclone Nargis, which hit the poor country of Myanmar, which was earlier known as Burma, uh, causing huge devastation and damage. In fact, about 100,000 people were estimated to have died. Now that figure has been revised upwards it is uh, estimated that something like 140,000 people died during that cyclone. <clears throat> we also know that tropical cyclone activity has increased in the North Atlantic as well. Remember Hurricane Katrina in 2005? It cost up to $200 billion. So you can imagine there's a direct link over here between an impact of climate change and business because any business in that area would be completely devastated. And I think if we are concerned about the future, then we have to worry about the fact that events like this are going to take place with much higher severity in other parts of the world as well. There are also many more forest fires. And in recent years, the Mediterranean, for instance, has been linked with droughts. <coughs> if you take the state of California and the US, you find that there is a, a very rapid increase in the frequency of forest fires. And some of them you can't even bring under control because they spread so rapidly. Uh, this has happened in Australia on a large scale. It's happened in other parts of the world as well. 
Heat waves have become more frequent over most land areas, and you remember in this very city, in 2003, you had a severe heat wave, and all over Europe, something like 35,000 people lost their lives. Now, if we continue with increase in greenhouse gas emissions, then this would induce many changes in the global climate system during the 21st century, and these would very likely be much worse and much larger than those observed during the 20th century. We have come to this very clear conclusion because things are getting worse and will continue to get much worse unless we do something about the very roots of this problem. <clears throat> so we've come up with projections of temperature increases during the 21st century. Uh, if we continue with emissions at current levels, then we would get an increase in temperature by the end of this century, ranging anywhere from 1.1 to 6.4 degrees Celsius. And this is based on assumptions of economic growth, of technological changes, demographic and other factors. So what we have is obviously a depiction, we have a representation of a whole range of possible scenarios in the future. And, uh, in order to focus on what is likely to happen, we have come up with two so-called best estimates. At the lower end, we've come up with an estimate of 1.8 degrees Celsius, and at the upper end, 4 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> what are the systems and sectors that would be affected by climate change? Water resources. And this is going to happen in every part of the globe. Agriculture in low latitudes is already being affected, not only because of water availability, but also because of changes in temperature. Low-lying coastal areas are going to be subjected to storm surges and flooding because of sea level rise. And therefore, as a result, there would also be much bigger damage on account of extreme weather events. Whether it's cyclones, whether it's storm surges, all of these <clears throat> are going to be much worse simply because the sea level is much higher now. Human health is also going to be affected because of floods, droughts, heat waves. But more than that, vector-borne diseases will increase because now uh, there are some uh, microbial organisms which would survive for much longer periods and in much larger numbers, and they would carry disease and therefore disease will also increase on that account. <clears throat> there are some ecosystems which are particularly vulnerable, like the tundra, boreal forests, mountain regions, Mediterranean-type ecosystems, tropical rainforests, mangroves and salt marshes, coral reefs, and sea, sea, uh, sea ice biome. So essentially, a number of living species across the planet would be affected as a result of climate change. And similarly, one can classify some regions which are going to be particularly vulnerable. The Arctic, as I've already mentioned. Africa, because of low adaptive capacity and projected climate change impacts. And I'll say a little more on that very soon. Small islands, which are very vulnerable to sea level rise. You take an, a country like the Maldive Islands, most of them, <clears throat> most of these islands are barely a meter or maximum of two meters above sea level. And if you have sea level rise of even half a meter, that's pretty dangerous for some of these places. This is true of a number of uh, islands in the South Pacific. Last year on World Environment Day, which is on the 5th of June, uh, the um, the president of Kiribati, now that for some reason it's uh, spelled Kiribati, K-I-R-I-B-A-T-I, -I -I, and that's not French. Otherwise, I can understand that the spelling would be very different from the pronunciation. <laughs> but uh, the president of Kiribati and I, and I might tell you something about English also, it's not just French. On one occasion, George Bernard Shaw said that... Uh, I can spell anything I want, any way I want in the English language. So uh, somebody asked him, 
Um, <clears throat> can you give us an example? He says, yes, I can spell fish as G-H-O-T-I. So they said, how can you explain that? He says, well, G-H would be like in rough, that you have the sound of F, O as in women, so that's like I, and T-I as in nation, so fish. So he came up with that explanation. Anyway, the president of Kiribati, spelled Kiribati, uh, and I were together in New Zealand on World Environment Day, and it was sad to see the president of a nation telling every audience that we jointly addressed that before the end of the century, all the people in his country will have to vacate that island. And they've already started doing that. Now, some of this will not have to be forced vacation. A lot of people have already started moving. You take the case of the Maldive Islands. Their best talent is being lost. They are moving overseas simply because they realize that their children and their grandchildren will probably not be able to live on those islands. So this, I think, is the ultimate tragedy. If we've caused a problem that is really causing this degree of, of alienation from the land where people were born, where their fathers, their grandfathers are buried, then clearly this is a very deep crisis for human society. Asian and African mega deltas are particularly vulnerable, and this includes cities like Shanghai. Uh, it includes uh, Dhaka, Kolkata, because these are cities that are on the deltas of rivers with very high population, with a large amount of property, and therefore, as a result, every time there's coastal flooding, there would be a threat to a large number of lives, and of course, damage to a large amount of property. <coughs> Glaciers are melting very rapidly. Take a look at this set of pictures. One was taken in 1996. The other was taken in 2009. Now, I come from a part of the world where the glaciers are the lifeblood of society. All the river systems in the northern part of the subcontinent originate in the glaciers over there. And with the melting of the glaciers, the streams of water flowing out of there are going to be progressively smaller. And therefore, the amount of water carried in the, in the rivers in the northern part of South Asia uh, would certainly decline. And that is going to affect, as we have estimated, the lives of 500 million people in South Asia and about 250 million people in China. The impacts on poor regions would be particularly severe. If you look at water stress by 2020, and that's just about 10 years away, in, uh, if you take the case of Africa, anywhere from 75 to 250 million people would be affected by water stress as a result of climate change. But what is even of greater concern is the fact that in certain African countries, you would have a decline of uh, crop yields by up to 50%. And remember, these are societies which are very poor to start with. They certainly will not have the resources to be able to import food to meet their very basic nutritional requirements. And it's also true that these are societies where you already have hunger, you already have malnutrition, you also have widespread disease in the form of HIV AIDS. So the adaptive capacity of a number of these countries that are going to be affected by the worst impacts of climate change is extremely low. And it is essential for the global community to come to their assistance. Because it's not the poor countries of the world that have caused this problem. The emissions of greenhouse gases have come from industrialization, and from countries that have attained high levels of prosperity in the process. So I'm raising this as an ethical issue. It is vitally important that we consider ethics not merely in decision making in a business enterprise, but ethics across countries as well. Because if we submerge our conscience in looking at ethical issues across nations, then clearly 
we cannot possibly take decisions in our own areas of work that have an ethical basis. I mean, ethics does not have any fine line of division. Ethics and behavior apply as much to business decision making as to governmental decision making. <clears throat> there would also be consequences on global security because by the end of the century we project there might be hundreds of millions of people who would have to leave their native land because of rising sea levels, extreme <coughs> events, floods and famines. And food security would be another factor that could result in chaos. And there's the possibility of uh, failed states as well, a large number of states that might actually fail. On the 22nd of September, the Secretary General of the UN had organized this major meeting on climate change where he got all the world leaders, including President Sarkozy of France, and I was privileged to speak after the Secretary General because he wanted me to explain to all the leaders over there the scientific realities of climate change. So I spoke after him. And after me was President Obama. And as I was going out of the stage, uh, <clears throat> he was getting ready to come in. So I greeted him. And I said, Mr. President, I need 10 minutes of your time. So he says, I also need 10 minutes of my time. So I said, well, that's very good. Then let's share it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, anyway, then he spoke. And uh, what was very heartening was the fact that all of the leaders who were there were clearly moved by the reality of the scientific basis of climate change. And I made it a point to mention that none of you, ladies and gentlemen, are going to escape the effects of failed states. I might tell you another little anecdote. Before the G8 summit in July, I tried very hard to get an appointment with Prime Minister Berlusconi in Italy because I thought I should get him interested <clears throat> in the reality of climate change. And since he was chairing the <clears throat> G8 meeting, I thought he should be sensitized to this. But anyway, I never got the meeting. I suppose his social calendar was very full. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> but um, somebody asked me, what would you tell him? And I said, uh, I thought for a while, and I said, yes. What I would tell him is that in your very neighborhood, you're likely to see, as a result of the impacts of climate change, a number of failed states. And what are those failed states going to export? They will export terrorism, illegal arms, illegal drugs, and illegal immigrants. And where would they come? To the southern part of Italy. <clears throat> anyway, I never got a chance to tell him that. Maybe one day I will succeed when uh, his social calendar opens up. Um, there will also be rising ethnic conflicts because there will be increasing competition between natural resources, not just between countries, but even communities. There are already several examples and several incidents of communities fighting over water rights, for instance. And this kind of problem is likely to increase. So what is it that we can do? I mean, I've given you all the bad news. Where is the good news? The good news comes from realization of the fact that delayed emissions reductions will significantly constrain the opportunity to achieve lower stabilization levels and increase the risk of more severe climate change impacts. So I think we have to take the threat that is inherent in climate change to spur us to action because we cannot allow ourselves, our children and grandchildren, to be exposed to these dangers. And one reason why I greatly enjoy and welcome opportunities to talk to young people like this audience, including the distinguished dean and, uh, and the faculty members, because I, I believe that those who work with young people will always remain young. <clears throat> There's a very old song of Nat King Cole, which I've been trying to get, and I finally have got it. 
um, it says, you will never grow old while there's love in your heart. So um, I think if one is in the company of young people and getting young ideas, uh, clearly that is a stimulant for keeping everybody uh, fully alive and fully youthful all through life. Um, what is it that we can do to bring about a redressal of this situation? Well, we can reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases to a level that we can stabilize the temperature of this planet. And what I'd like you to do to, is to focus on the top row of numbers in this table. If we want to stabilize global mean temperature to between 2 to 2.4 degrees Celsius, that requires stabilization of concentration of these greenhouse gases just a little above where we are today. So in other words, we don't have too much room for maneuver. We have to act very fast. And in fact, what it says over here is that CO2 emissions would have to peak no later than 2015. And that's only five years away, basically. All right? And we would need to reduce our emissions by 2050, globally, by anywhere from 50 to 85%. Now, this is a tough challenge. But it's a challenge if we don't meet, then clearly we are going to end up with the impacts that I just tried to explain to you. Most people will tell you that Reducing emissions of greenhouse gases will lead to loss of jobs, loss of economic output, but that's a myth. There is no truth in that. We have carefully assessed what the cost would be of this kind of mitigation strategy. And the cost in 2030, which is 20 years from now, will be less than 3% 3, 3 of the global GDP. Now, is that a high price to pay for saving humanity from all the impacts and not just humanity, all living species, from the worst impacts of climate change that are going to take place in the future? Certainly not. But what is also important is to realize what this really means, what this mitigation strategy means. Well, suppose we didn't have any mitigation, and let's assume GDP growth took place steadily and in a linear fashion. This is the kind of line we would get. What would happen if we carried out mitigation? Well, the same line would just bend a little downwards because now GDP growth may be slightly lower because remember I said 3% of the global GDP may be lost in 2030. What that really means is that in 2030, the level of prosperity that the world would have reached would at best be postponed by a few months or the maximum of a year. That's precisely what it means and that's all that it means. But there are many co-benefits from mitigation because if you reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, you would also be reducing emissions that lead to local pollution. So there would be huge health benefits from doing that. There would be more employment. For instance, when you develop renewable energy technologies and devices, there's much greater employment. You take the case of Germany, which has followed a very proactive policy for development of renewables. They have created an entirely new industry. And as a result, they've also generated hundreds of thousands of new jobs. So renewable energy, if we were to go in for it on a large scale, really gives you much greater, greater employment pot potential than centralized forms of energy supply. And globally, there would be increased energy security. So therefore, mitigation brings about many co-benefits which makes it a very attractive approach for human society to follow. And may I say that the current economic downturn is indeed a unique opportunity when we can look at some very basic changes that need to be brought about. And those basic changes would essentially help us move to a new pattern of development particularly as far as the energy sector is concerned. <clears throat> so we know that there's substantial potential for the mitigation of global greenhouse gas emissions over the coming decades. And this can lead to reduction of emissions below current levels on a large scale. And also the good news is that all the technologies, all the te techniques that we require 
for mounting <coughs> mitigation on a large scale are all available to us or on the verge of commercialization. But if we want to develop new technologies, then we'll need a package of policies that provide the incentives, that provide the conditions by which business would invest in new technologies. Because unless business knows that, let's say, the future lies in low carbon technologies, and unless business sees policies that would lead to low carbon technologies, obviously they're not going to inv invest in research and development or the dissemination of these technologies. So here there is a clear role for government. Government has to provide the incentives by which business moves in a direction that would serve the interests of society. There are several technologies that will have to be developed, and I'm not going to go into all of them, certainly in the area of energy supply, certainly in the case of transport. I mean, the TGV, I think, is a remarkable example of an energy-efficient way of transportation. I spent a good part of my time uh, in New Haven, which is near New York, uh, at Yale University. And <clears throat> you find a large number of people traveling from New York to Washington and vice versa, traveling by air. And that, to my mind, is an extremely stupid and suboptimal way of transportation. If there was something like the TGV in North America, why would anybody fly between New York and Washington, D.C.? You would travel by train from city center to city center, perhaps in an hour and a half. But this is where, may I submit, that we need a major transformation in the transport sector throughout the world. And over a period of time, of course, the private vehicle is not going to vanish because that's so much a convenience, so much a part of everybody's dream that we will always use cars. But we must have public transport options. <coughs> Otherwise, you would be using cars where no public transport is available. So here, I think we need a public-private partnership by which we bring about a transformation in uh, the transport sector. Buildings are another area <coughs> where we need <coughs> major innovations. The building you see at the bottom uh, of this slide is something that my institute has created. We have a training complex which uses no electricity from the grid. How have we done that? Well, first we've designed the, the entire complex in such a way that the, the demand for energy is about one third that of a, a conventional building. And then all that demand is met through photovoltaics or a biomass based gasifier or a very important thing that we have come up with is something called earth air tunnels. Because four meters below the surface of the earth, the temperature is uniform throughout the year. And we've designed these tunnels through which we blow air. And the only energy required is that of a blower. And that air comes into the living spaces. In the winter, it gives you heating. And in the summer, it gives you cooling. Now, these are things that we must employ. And all of these actually save money over a period of time. <clears throat> this is a listing of technologies expected to be commercialized before 2030. And I won't go into these. But I think business decisions within a stable policy framework will certainly make sure that these technologies develop. And I think the future of the energy sector in particular, but several other activities, lies in the direction of low carbon technologies. This is something that I think those of you young ladies and gentlemen who are going into business must remember. And you have to focus, as I always say, not at the next quarter, but the next quarter century. That's where you're going to create winners as far as business is concerned. Because if you had a steady state condition, if everything was business as usual, then of course you don't have to worry. But if you're going to deal with major turning points and a major transition in society, then you better be looking far ahead and making investment decisions, R&D de decisions that focus far into the future. 
We need a number of instruments, policies and research, development and demonstration, of course. You need appropriate energy infrastructure investments. And we need regulations, whether it is the automobile efficiency regulations or appliance efficiency regulations or buildings which require regulations. We certainly need changes in lifestyles and consumption patterns. And people ask me what kinds of changes in lifestyles and what I tell them often makes me very unpopular because I tell them eat less meat and eat less red meat. <clears throat> Some people will ask, where will I get my proteins from? And the answer that I got from a very uh, distinguished gentleman is what I'm going to tell you. Uh, there are two consultants who can tell you how to get proteins from plant food. And these consultants are called an elephant and a horse. They get all their proteins from plant material. So I think it's a fallacy to say that you can only get proteins from, uh, from meat and from nothing else. Of course, I get a lot of hate mail on this. And one person actually sent me an email saying that the trouble with you is you are undernourished. And, and, you, <laughs> and, your, and your brain is not getting enough nourishment. That's why you're advocating uh, eating less meat. But I'm happy to say that uh, in the city of Ghent, which I believe is pronounced as Gant, uh, <clears throat> in Belgium, I addressed an audience uh, a little over a year ago and there were about six or 700 people over there. And that started a movement as a result of which now that city has declared one day a week as a meat-free day. Sir Paul McCartney of the Beatles uh, <clears throat> is a confirmed vegetarian, has been so for the last 30 years. He and I are actually teaming up. He's become a good friend of mine. Uh, he and I are teaming up on the 3rd of December for an event in Brussels to try and propagate the same thing, one day a week without meat. And he and I became friends because Yale University gave both of us uh, <clears throat> honorary doctorates. And I can tell you, uh, that's a day when you, feel, you should feel very proud of your, your achievement. Um, getting an honorary doctorate from Yale is, is something that you know one should feel proud about. But I actually came back with a huge complex because the two of us were walking in procession, one up behind the other, and he was getting all the attention and all the whistles and cheers, and here I was, poor guy, following him, and nobody even noticed me. So it gave me a complex, but you know, it's a complex for a good reason. <clears throat> anyway, one fact that is going to be very important is an effective carbon price signal. And I salute President Sarkozy for going ahead with this concept of a carbon tax, because I think that's going to be the most effective instrument to bring about change in the marketplace. <clears throat> Let me go through the rest quickly. Um, uh, greenhouse gas investment decisions would certainly be driven by consumer preferences, costs, competitiveness, and government regulation. So you really need a coalition of all the stakeholders to bring about change. Uh, impacts of climate change on business, and here I'd like to just come to the final part of what I'm saying. Why should business be concerned? Well, business will be affected by extreme weather events, and companies must therefore design uh, means by which they can adapt to the impacts of climate change. Industry is also vulnerable to changes in consumer preference and government regulation. If consumers are going to prefer green products and low carbon products, then you better anticipate that and start producing them. And government regulation also has to be predicted because if you are investing in something today, which government regulation will not allow tomorrow, well, you better change your investment today then. And companies that lag, lag behind will certainly suffer from loss of prestige. Main drivers to industrial mitigation, the return on investments are very high, certainly for energy efficiency, technology de development and transfer. There's going to be a huge market 
particularly in the developing countries. So I think if you invest in that, you would benefit. There will be legally mandated mitigation. It's going to come after Cop Copenhagen in December or soon thereafter. And you would have to come up with transparent policies because otherwise there'll be all kinds of public barriers and economic barriers. And you have to be aware of consumer attitudes shifting over time. There are many sectors where we would need to bring about investments, clean energy, environmental resource management, energy and material efficiency, environmental services. So there's a whole new set of industries which are going to come up. Now, these don't necessarily have to be new companies. Companies that are working today may need to diversify into some of these areas, and they would do very well. Now, this is an example of the aviation industry uh, where they have come up with long-term plans by which they want to cut down emissions. Even though aviation is going to grow, they want to make sure that they come up with aircraft and practices by which they cut down on their emissions significantly. <clears throat> and what we need, therefore, is a new industrial revolution, revolution where sustainable natural resource management will be the key. And uh, we'll have to ensure that the new form of uh, industrialization and economic development does not in any way affect the ecological health of this planet. So what we're really talking about, a major transition, and this is going to happen, much like the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. I think that's what we have. Now, I'm ending with this silhouette of <coughs> Mahatma Gandhi. He said, democracy must, in essence, therefore, mean the art and science of mobilizing the entire physical, economic, and spiritual resources of all the various sections, uh, of all the various sections of the people in the service of the common good for all. <clears throat> and therefore, I think those who are going to be working in business organizations will now have to ensure that they keep the interests of the public clearly in focus. Because if you don't do that, then at some stage it's going to rebound on you. And I want to end by giving you an example of how innovation is going to be extremely important, even in meeting the challenge of poverty. In poor countries today, you have mobile phones where no one could have even thought they might get telephones or access to telephones in the past. Now, as it happens, there are 1.6 billion people in this world who have no access to electricity. So you can imagine when the sun goes down, they use candles, they use uh, kerosene lamps, and very feeble and polluting forms of uh, lighting. But through the innovation that we have carried out, my institute has done this, we are now promoting solar lanterns which have really opened up a new opportunity. And I want to show you a very brief video on that just to tell you that even in the poorest regions of the world, technology can make a difference and you can create business models by which you benefit in business and society benefits by bringing about a complete change in their living standards. So could we have the video, please? And if possible, we can switch off the lights. <coughs> Ah, okay, okay. Sorry. Sure. Thank you. And the sound? Yes. You see, this is a good example of innovation. <laughs> when you run into a problem, all you need is some ingenious method by which you can make things work. And a solution. 
there's something to learn from this. You can switch off the light. It's a very clean movie, don't get excited. <laughs> sound. I'm sorry, the sound is not working. Ah, yeah. Sorry, the sound didn't work initially, but uh, I hope you got the Thank you very much. Thank you.
Um, sorry, we won't have time for questions because Dr. Pashuri is going back uh, uh, very early, so he's got a flight uh, this afternoon. I would like to welcome um, Véronique Malray, Dean of Faculty, uh, for the final ceremony of Professor Honoris Causa. Dear Professor Pachori, first of all, I would like to thank you for accepting the invitation Valerie has kindly transmitted you on behalf of HEC. Thank you also for sharing with us, professors, students, members of HEC staff, the results of the research work you have been working on over the last years. It's a great opportunity for us. As probably most of the MBA participants and master students who are here today do not know exactly what is an honoris causa professor, I will briefly explain it so that everybody can really understand the meaning of the ceremony. Becoming an HEC professor honoris causa means that our community rewards Professor Pachori's contribution to science. It also means that his contribution goes beyond the frontiers of the institutions in which Professor Pachori is or has been working. HEC community knows that Professor Pachori's work changes the content of what we teach, the way we do research, the vision of the world we develop. To illustrate this point, let me come back to some characteristics of Professor Pachori's presentation. Professor Pachori has been able to mobilize different disciplines, ecology, economy, technology, while very often the scientists of these different domains do not understand each other, do not know the results of the research undertaken by the others, sometimes even ignore the colleagues of the other groups. Open-mindedness and capacity of integration is probably a key to answer to complex questions. Professor Pachori has shown how companies are impacted by climate changes, but also how these changes could be a source of new opportunities for them. By building bridges between ecology and the business world, by putting in equations not only economic realities, but also environmental realities, he made our responsibilities clearer and the consequences of our decisions more readable. Transforming knowledge into action is the core mission of a professor, and Professor Pachori demonstrated that he is an eminent professor. Finally, Professor Pachori, I thank you for having shown to our students that it's possible to combine the rigor of scientific discourse with personal conviction, that change can be an opportunity, and that each of us is an architect of tomorrow's world. I have therefore the honor to name you HEC Professor Nois Koza, and I'm happy to welcome you in our academic community. After the academic dimension, uh, just a more material dimension. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I forgot to, to introduce our colleague from NHH in uh, Norge. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Rector. It's an opportunity. You know we are working on a double degree on sustainable development with NHH, and it's an opportunity to welcome you. I forgot that to, to introduce to you at the beginning. Thank you.
it's important for them to feel responsible and to understand that they can do something well, because yes. they often people make them frightened and don't make them responsible and that's feel that they are actors also that's of their culture. Yes. That's, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please visit us at www.agc.edu. Please visit us at www.agc.edu.